Hello, I'm Michael Wilde, reporting to you live from the London quarantine. Um, and I've got some time on my hands, it turns out. So today we're going through sculpting in ZBrush. The previous video I put out has been watched and liked by a lot of you guys, but it was about the UI and not really about sculpting. So today we're going to go through actual sculpting in ZBrush. We're going to go through all the tools, all of the brushes, what materials are, what dynameshing is, Z remeshing, all of that stuff. And then finally, I'm going to do a time lapse of me actually sculpting something from scratch in ZBrush. So yeah, if you haven't used ZBrush before, watch this whole thing. We're going to go through all of the tools probably quite quickly, but either slow it down uh, in the YouTube timing settings or rewatch it if anything doesn't make sense. And you can leave a question or whatever below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you're just here to see how I sculpt and how I approach that, you can skip along to the end. I'll put a timestamp or something in the video description and we're gonna sculpt a goldfish from scratch. I'll probably, as I'm talking here, just put a quick uh, teaser of that so you can see what we're going through. Hope everybody's staying safe out there and hopefully this is, video is of some use to you. Cool, let's get started. Cool, so we're in ZBrush and I'm gonna get started. So first things first, to get sculpting, we need an object. So I've just loaded ZBrush fresh. My setup might look slightly different to yours because I've changed the background color and I've got my brush tab here on the on the left. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the ZBrush UI, then you can watch my previous video on that. We've already covered that. So I'm not gonna to go too much into detail with that, just the tools and stuff that I do use. So first of all, when you've loaded up ZBrush, we wanna bring in our tool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select something here one of these pre-made objects and I'm just going to go import and that's going to import a 3D mesh. It's going to bring up this UI, copy and paste my location, pop that in and we're going to just find an OBJ or whatever you're sculpting. It needs to be an object file. And then, so to get sculpting, I'm going to hold shift to um, lock it into rather than any angle, I can lock it into like this. And then that's dropped onto the canvas now. And then I'm going to go to edit mode rather than the draw mode. So I don't pop another one down. I'm going to go to edit and now we have our object. So uh, my, it's a bit dark because of my color there. So just change the color to lighten it up a bit. So now we have our object. So that's importing an object into ZBrush. You could also use one of these predefined ones. So we've got this object here. If I click this now, it's gonna to switch to something else here. And if I click and hover over this, you can see we've got other predefined objects. We've got like a sphere, a cube, a cylinder, all these different ones that you can kind of start with as well. We've got Z-spheres as well, which we won't cover in this video, but that's something to look into as well. Um, so if I wanted to use this, I could start sculpting on this. However, if you do wanna use one of the predefined shapes and you're not importing something, then one button you have to press here. If I tried to sculpt now, you would see, to enable sculpting, please convert this 3D primitive to a poly mesh 3D. So to do that, all you need to do is click make poly mesh 3D here, and now you have a sculptable version of it. So that's just a little tip to know. So I'm gonna pop over to this model. So let's quickly talk about, we've got this palette here called the subtools. So subtools are something you're going to be working with a lot in ZBrush. So I've brought in this object here and I've got, for example, the eyes, I've got this like nicotine membrane, all that stuff, and the tongue and the teeth and the collar all in one OBJ. But so if I were to move things around, then everything moves with it. But I probably don't want that to happen. I probably want to keep the eye spherical as I'm working. So what you could do is you could import them one at a time or when you're inside of ZBrush, you've also got an option to split stuff up. Let's first of all add a separate let's add another subtool to this. So inside of our project, we've got more than just one thing. So the way we're gonna do that is you can either use this append or insert. They do exactly the same thing. It just depends where they add them in the queue. So I'm just gonna go insert for now and let's insert a sphere. So now we have this sphere in my scene as well. So I can move this around separately from the other thing. This is how I added the eyes in the first place is I just kind of put spheres in and sort of scaled them to the eye. So you could do that, you could import another object. So I could import something else here. Let's try, I don't know what this is, this choker for example. So I've got this choker and then I could, I could go back to my previous object and insert that choker if I wanted to by just clicking insert and then it's another subtool. Um, so where is it? It's here inside the object. Um, so if I zoom out for some reason, the positioning is a bit weird on it, but it's there if I wanted to bring that in. Because I've already got this in here, then I'm gonna go down to delete and that's gonna delete the subtool. Something that you can't undo, so don't delete stuff if you think you're gonna need it later on. All you can do, if you don't wanna delete it, you can just press this I button and when you click off of it now to another subtool, it's gonna be hidden. Uh, you can see it popping in and out there. But because I know I'm not gonna need it, I'm gonna delete it. And this sphere as well, I'm also gonna delete. So one thing you can do is if you've brought everything in already, you can use the split. So we can do, 
if we go down here to split, this will probably be hidden. If you just click on that, it will show everything. So we can do split to similar parts, split to parts, split unmasked points or split mask points. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go split to similar parts and that will keep things like eyes that are similar. It should keep them in one subtool rather than having one subtool for this eye and one subtool for that. So let's have a look at that. I'm gonna, again, not undoable, but because I've got this object saved in as OBJ, if it does muck up, then I can just re-import it, no problem. So yeah, you can see now we've got different subtools for everything. Um, so this sun piece down here, it's kind of split all of these different elements and I kind of want them to be one. So what we can do is now that we've split some, we can also merge. So down here below merge, we've got these merge options. I'm just gonna go merge down and that will merge the, the two things below it. So just make sure, again, it's undoable. So make sure that you know you're merging the right thing. So I'm just gonna go merge down. It's gonna ask me if I'm okay with this. I'm gonna go always okay, so I don't have to click this every time. I'm just gonna check everything below. I wanna actually merge down. So I'm just gonna keep on doing that. And there we go, now I've got them as a single subtool. So you can hold Alt on your keyboard and just click on another subtool to jump to it, which is quite handy. So if I'm sculpting on this one, you can see now it doesn't affect that. So I'm gonna go to my standard brush, BST, um, and now it doesn't affect that. But if I wanted to sculpt on this, I can't do it anymore. So what I can do is I can either jump up to that in the subtool menu, or I can press Alt on that, and now I can sculpt on here. Uh, so basically I can begin sculpting away on this. So if I were to do like this, uh, but you can see it's quite blocky. So one of the first things you wanna do in ZBrush is understand about the subdivision levels. So on the right hand side, we've got all our settings for our object here. So I'm gonna to go to geometry first of all, and you can see now we've got these things called divide and higher res and all these kind of options here. So this is where we can subdivide and basically give our mesh more polygons. So at the moment we've only got 88,000. So that's why it's looking a bit blocky. You can kind of see the faceting of all the different faces. So if I click divide now, what it's gonna do is it's gonna subdivide that object so we have another level of detail that we can sculpt onto. And straight away you can see that those squares have got a bit smaller. And if I go to my polyframe, if we switch back, you can see that it's subdivided and it's split every face into four faces. And then because of that, the poly count has quadrupled. If I turn poly frame off, I'm gonna do it again. And you're starting to not see those faces. One more time. And it's gone up to five million now, so I'm gonna leave it at that. But you can go really as high as your computer will let you. Let's see, 20 million, I've got that there. And now when I sculpt, you're not seeing those faces anymore. So I'm just gonna undo that. And I'm gonna go back down to four just for the speed of this video. And I'm gonna click here so you can see it's got our levels of subdivision so we can go back down to one at any time and we can go up to five. Um, you can drag it or you can click this lower res here as well. I'm gonna delete the higher now just so that I don't have that. You can also delete your lower. I wouldn't recommend doing that. There's not really any time that um, I would do that apart from like really niche situations but just be careful that you don't do that because then you will lose all the information um if you do then there are ways to get around that you can reconstruct subdivisions but because this is an introduction video we're not going to go too much more into that cool so now that we we have our object um how do we sculpt that's what this video is about right so i'm sculpting by just dragging onto the mesh um you can change your brushes, we're gonna get more into that, but let's first of all just go through the basic sculpting functions. You can sculpt, push it out by just drawing, dragging. Uh, if you want to push in, you can hold Alt, and that does the reverse function. Um, up here on the top, you can see we've got this Z add and Z sub of these brush options. Again, this was covered in that UI video that I've already made, and that does exactly the same thing, but I always keep it to Z add and um, just use the Alt key to do the reverse function. We've also, with the shift key selected, we're gonna change, so we've got our brushes up here, we're gonna change from the standard brush to the smooth brush. So I'm always pressing that if I wanna just smooth out details. If I go down to a lower subdivision, you'll see that um, working a bit better. And then if we pop up to a higher subdivision, all those details will be smoothed out from that lower subdivision, but we still got a little bit of detail from that higher one. Um, so sometimes if you're smoothing, make sure you're hopping up and down subdivisions because sometimes the details can be left in higher subdivisions. And we've also, if we hold the control key, we can also get into masking. So I'm gonna go over masking a little bit later, but those are the basic functions that I'll be using when I'm sculpting on my keyboard. Cool. As you can see, this mesh is fairly symmetrical. If I press, if I'm sculpting, then it's not doing symmetry on the other side. So you can hit X on your keyboard and that will enable symmetry. Be careful because sometimes you can turn it off without realizing and then you do all this work and it hasn't carried over the other side. 
So that's just something to keep out an eye out for. Another keyboard thing we've got is lazy mouse. So when I drag, you can see there's this little red line coming out of the cursor. And that basically smooths out all of my brush strokes. So if you want to turn that off, if I do it now, you can see it's it's applying it a lot more fiercely because we don't have that averaging. But by pressing L on your keyboard, you can apply lazy mouse and you can do that to any brush. But you can also go to the stroke function and lazy mouse here and you can change the settings if you want a bit more fidelity and tuning on that. But just another keyboard shortcut to be aware of. So, so far, I'm just using the standard brush. We've got this one up here. So you can either hit B or you can click on this to change brushes. So if we hit B at any time on our canvas, then it brings up this brush menu, which is exactly the same as going up over here to the brushes. But you can kind of do it from here and it's just a little bit quicker, especially when you're sculpting on the fly, then I'll always be hitting B and jumping through brushes. So by default, we've got this kind of standard brush that we're using. Um, we've got a lot of brushes here and there are some that you probably never use. There are some that are a bit more bespoke. For example, we've got some that do grooming and the kind of hair tools that you're not gonna use on a daily basis for normal sculpting probably. You've got these ones that kind of insert very specific things like zip pieces. But in general, the ones that you're gonna be using for sculpting are the ones with sort of these spheres and then showing the effects and these ones with slightly more bespoke icons probably won't be used. But what I would recommend is just kind of go through all the brushes when you've got your object in ZBrush, just have a bit of a play around if you've never used them before and kind of see what some of them do and pick and choose your favorites. Obviously, I'm gonna go through some of the ones that I use the most here now, but um, it really isn't kind of experimenting thing. And it's, it's much like painting or sculpting in real life. Um, everybody sort of has their own workflows and way of working. So by default, you're gonna be using this standard brush and we're gonna, we've already seen what that does. So that just kind of adds fairly rounded sort of detail I think it's easier actually if I show this on a sphere. So we're just gonna pop over to that sphere that I made earlier. We're gonna subdivide this a couple of times. And so this is a normal standard brush, just adds fairly rounded peaks to your objects and you can hold Alt to do the reverse. So um, another one that I use all the time is clay build up. So one handy trick that you can do, if you know the name of your brush already, when you've got this brush menu open, you can press the letter on the keyboard that it begins with. So for example, I wanna look at the clay. So I'm gonna press C on my keyboard. And then that shows me only the ones that begin with C. And then when it's done that, you can see that they've corresponded with another letter. So I can press L to go for clay, or I can press B to go for clay buildup. So when you're sculpting really quickly, if I just press BCB really quick, then I've jumped straight into that. And I know, for example, the standard brush is BST. So these are, these are quick workflow tips that you don't necessarily need to use when you're beginning, but it's just good to know that it's there. So I'm gonna press C um, just to kind of show everything that begins with C, and I'm gonna go along and I'm gonna press clay. So this is the clay brush. It's adding fairly like circular, but flat on top, um, definition to our object and we can hold alt but you can see it kind of piles up in a way that the smooth brush didn't um, so as if you're kind of putting clay onto your surface so this can be quite nice if you want a fairly sort of faceted look to the mesh or if you're building kind of structure up um, quite early on in your sculpt then this can be good and then you can go in and kind of smooth it out a bit take a bit away but also you notice it's not going below a certain value even if I go back over it it's not going any further whereas the smooth brush if I do that then the more I do it the more it takes away so that's just one thing that it's doing so we're going to go back I'm going to press b and we're going to go to clay build up so build up is different to um the standard clay brush and that it will build up like the clay wouldn't. So if I go back on top of it, it's adding more. Also by default, it's got an alpha here. We'll talk more about alphas later, but it's a bit more square. And this is one of the brushes that I use the most. I'll kind of just go in and add structure this way. So say I'm sculpting a face and I can kind of block in the nose really quickly. And then I can use the, the alternative, the removing to kind of take away some space for the eyes and stuff like that. Um, so that's a really beautiful face that I've got there. And then I can just go in and kind of smooth stuff out. And that's kind of how I structure things. And you'll see later, there'll be a demonstration late in this video where I show, um, well, you'll probably see me using that quite a bit. So we've got the move tool here. The move tool is a really great one. Um, I'm going to scale up my brush size. So we can do that either at the top here, we've got the draw size, um, or you can press space at any time. You can hold that. And you've got all these options at the top but just kind of on the canvas. Same with the brushes. Um, it's just a shortcut that really helps speed up your workflow. So all the move tool does, I'm gonna press X on my keyboard to get symmetry. The move tool basically lets you move around a mesh. So I'm just gonna scale it up. If you've used soft select in Maya or anything like that, then it's quite similar to that. And you can just kind of redefine the shape of your object quite quickly. So say you were making a face and you can just kind of make it a bit more face-like. Um, but that's one I use a lot. And then I can also get a bit more fidelity by going in and making it a bit smaller. So I can bring points out, push them in by using the Alt um, 
key on that to kind of take things in. So that's a handy one. We've also got the flatten brush. So I use this one quite a lot. Flatten just kind of smooth points off, um, makes it a bit more hard edged. So that's a really handy one. And then I can use Alt as well to bring it up a bit. But if you're doing a hard surface, then the flatten, or also we've got the, if I press H on my keyboard, because I know it's called H polish, then we've got this one as well, which does quite a similar effect, but it's just a bit tighter. Again, a lot of these brushes don't have a huge amount of difference between them. They've just got a few things that are maybe tweaked and a bit different. Over here, if you go to your brush menu, which I've moved to the side here, then you can kind of change. There's a lot of options, which we're not gonna go into now because this is just a beginner's video, but um, there's a lot of options you can change. For example, you can change the depth of how deep into the surface your brush affects or you can change the orientation of the stroke or the twist and all these different modifiers, or you can make it so that the pressure changes more or that it doesn't paint on the back faces of your object. A lot of things that you can do with these brushes, but by default, there are some really good ones that you don't, I don't use this a huge amount, um, but again, good thing to go through and just kind of experiment. Another great one for kind of flattening things off, we've got this trim adaptive and trim dynamic down here. So I'm gonna use trim adaptive and this is just a really great way to kind of carve into your object. So I use this if I'm sculpting rocks um, and then trim dynamic, very similar, just not quite as aggressive with what it's doing there. So you can just kind of get that and work up nice kind of hard surface edges, especially for rocks, that's really helpful. Another great one that I use is this DAM standard, which I think stands for Damien, um, the guy that made it. So what this one does is it basically, it cuts into your mesh but it's quite, a, it kind of adds this pinch at the same time. So you can get really nice if you're doing wrinkles or if you're kind of going in and if I wanted to define this edge a little bit more, then we can go in and do that. Or I can use the Alt to kind of get a peak, which can be quite nice to run along the edge of things, but because it's pinching as well, then it's just kind of helping bring out the edges on your mesh. So that's a great one. So if we move back over to this, this cat, so I could be using this to kind of define these folds a bit more. And then I could go in, add the, with a bit of clay buildup, which is B, C, B on my keyboard. And then I could just go in and kind of define these a bit more and make them kind of sit over if I, and then I'm gonna smooth that out. So that's my kind of general workflow. I'll just be switching between brushes. Um, again, we'll go through that right at the end. I've got a time-lapse of something that I did make and I'll talk over that. I mentioned earlier that this clay buildup has got an alpha. So let's talk about alphas a bit. So if I took this off, instead of the square shape that it has, it's gone back to rounded. So if we go to the um, uh, standard brush, which is B, S, and then I'm showing all the stand or the ones that begin with S, then we've got the standard brush somewhere here. So we've got that. So this one, which was quite round, um, if I applied an alpha with this now, you'd see the difference. So let's take, this is quite a dramatic one here. And now we've got this kind of rake effect pushing out instead of just a rounded smooth, and then I can do alt. So this could be quite good if you're getting a bit, I don't know what this would be, but in stone or something like that, you could use this kind of effect. So alphas really do can change a lot of the, about the brushes. By default, we've got this um, dot stroke mode on the standard, but one that I particularly like to use is um, this drag rectangle. And then what I can do is I can just place this alpha once over. So if, let's take this crackling alpha, for example, and then we can just pop this here, probably do that on the nose because cat's noses are quite, they've got all these kind of scales on them. So we can use that instead. And then each time I place it, then unlike when it was the dots, which would just go on top of each other and look a bit messy and noisy, then we can kind of play with that and play with the alphas. We've also got a section here where we can add textures. I'm not gonna go into textures on this because um, poly paint and texturing in ZBrush is a whole topic in itself. Um, but just be aware that you can also add color to your strokes. Underneath that, we've got this material section. So by default, whenever you start sculpting in ZBrush, you're gonna get this kind of ready material. Not my favorite. The materials can often change the way that your sculpt looks just because of the way they handle light. We've got all of these ones here. We've got some really crazy ones up in this matte cap. So for example, let's have a look at uh, this droplets one, which is heavily chrome. Um, we've got this sketch gummy one, which kind of shows a lot more of the fasting. You've kind of got this weird, like almost ambient occlusion sort of look to it. Um, my favorites, you've got this basic material down here, which is just a fairly standard one, um, helps you see your sculpt a little bit better. But the ones I usually use are yeah, either basic material one or basic material two. Um, two has just got a slightly nicer specular. And then if I change this color thing here on the left, I can set it to what I want. So let's say for example, this cat that I ended up texturing blue in the end, which you can see on my art station. So I could set it like that if I wanted to, or I can go back to that basic material uh, if I wanted to get rid of that specular. 
We've got some other ones here. Skin Shade, I think, is quite nice for skin because it just softens out the details a bit, which kind of replicates how subsurface scattering in a shader will kind of get rid of a lot of your details. You'll kind of lose that. So this just helps visually show that. And again, like the brushes, you've got a material tab here and you can kind of modify any of this. So I could change the specular, for example, if I wanted it a bit tighter or whatever. Um, again, not something I usually do. I usually just stick to one of these basic ones, but it's just good to know. So we talked a bit about masking. Um, when would I use masking? What's masking for? Masking is really great. So for example, we've got this eye here and I just wanted to move the top eyelid. So if I go to my brush menu and I press M for the move tool, it's already up here, but um, down here, BMV is the shortcut on that one. If I went and I just wanted to kind of bring this eyelid down a bit, if I go like that, then the bottom lid is also gonna move. But if I just wanted to move the top bit, then what I can do is I can mask that off so I'm using the control key um, and I can mask this section off. And then when you're masking, if you hold control and click outside, not on your object, on the blank canvas, then it will invert that mask. And you can then, I could just use the move tool and I can now just move that section without, it doesn't move anything outside of the mask. So that's really good for kind of freezing that. Also you can use it for normal sculpting. So if I just wanted to sculpt here, just add the details of this section and nowhere else, then if I draw out outside of this, then it's not going to affect that. Um, so that can be super handy. So what if you don't have an object that you want to sculpt on, you will kind of want to sculpt from scratch, like you would do in the real world if you're just adding clay to stuff and building the form from scratch. Well, ZBrush has this really cool function called DynaMesh, which lets you kind of rejig the topology as you sculpt. And it means that you can kind of build things from scratch in ZBrush. So not always are you gonna have an object inside a ZBrush to work with. You might wanna create something from scratch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, I use the clay build up often with this mode when I'm doing this, and I'm gonna hit symmetry on again. So if I were to start sculpting out a lot, you can see that because the way this topology works, we're getting really stretched polygons. I can't now add much more detail to that section. So what DynaMesh is going to do is it's going to look at this mesh, it's going to reevaluate everything, and it will even out the topology everywhere so that I get some more definition in here. So this is in the geometry section. We've got geometry here. And if we go down to DynaMesh, we've got this option here. So now if I click this, without changing any of the options, we'll see what happens. So it's changed the topology on everything. It's not necessarily good topology, but it means that now I can go in here and sculpt again. But now if I want to DynaMesh, this option, I can't press this again now because it's already highlighted. So when you've got DynaMesh activated here, all you need to do is hold the control key and drag, just like with the masking again. And what it's going to do is it will re-DynaMesh. So I can add more bits, re-DynaMesh by holding control and dragging out a box. And that's kind of how you can just kind of make something up from scratch. And let's have a look at some of these other options before I turn DynaMesh on. So what we've got is we've got this resolution thing. So you can turn it up really high. So let's, it was at 128, now it's at 700. Let's see what happens now. If I hit DynaMesh, then it's taking a lot longer to work out this time and the mesh is so much denser and we've got a million polys now. So I've got a lot more detail. So when you're DynaMeshing, I would recommend starting really low, probably even lower than what it was set to, which was 128. So I usually set, start about 100 and kind of go from there. Um, and I can just start moving things around and kind of going from there. And that's how I'd work up a sculpt. So this this cat was actually dynameshed in, it was all created in ZBrush. I started from a sphere and started sculpting in all the folds and all the eyes. I was like removing clay for the eyes. So here's what I made earlier. Um, this was all dynameshed, but let's say I want to start subdividing on this and adding more levels. So if I click divide, we're going to start dividing on top of this really odd topology. And if I took this into Maya or something else to render or texture, it's going to be really strange and not great to UV and definitely isn't going to work to deform an animation. So we've got this really handy feature called zero mesher. So when I'm happy with my DynaMesh sculpt and I know that the general proportions and stuff aren't going to move too much and I kind of want to retopologize it and lock it down, then what we've got underneath here is we've got this really handy tool called zero mesher. So what zero mesher does is it basically takes a DynaMeshed or any any sort of like funky mesh um, topology and it's going to remake it into quads um, and try and do it as nicely as possible. So much like DynaMesh, it's got all these different options. You can set the polygon count, you can make it so that it's just half of the same. So I could set it so that it's half of what I originally have or the moment this is going to aim for kind of 5%. So we've also got this adaptive button and that's basically going to change the density of the different polygons where it needs to. So you can set it 
really low and that will mean that all of the quads are kind of ex try and be exactly the same size whereas adaptive if you set it up to 100 then it's going to mean that there's going to be quite a lot of difference in the size of polygons but it's going to do it where it kind of sees necessary so for now i'm not going to change any of these options we're just going to click z remesher and see what happens it's going to take a second to think about it and now we've got pretty good topology all things considered from that really horrible mesh so it's down to 13,000 polygons um, I can see there's some, it's probably not high enough around here. We've got some weirdness, but this flow, the curve lines follow that mesh. We've got loops around this eye. They might not be perfect. Sometimes the loops are a little bit funny, but it's a great place to start from. If you want to take this into Topogun or Maya or something, then you can retopo bits to get nice edge loops if there is a bit of funniness. Or if you're not animating it, you're just using it um, for texturing, then this could well be perfect for you. Again, not perfect topology, but much better than we had before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change that poly count. I've undone that. I'm going to change that poly count to 15, so three times as much. Uh, and we'll see what that gives us around here. And if it's a little bit better, then it's good to go. Cool. So that's given us much better results around here. We're not seeing as much kind of weird shearing. And then now I've got this and I can just kind of press shift and start smoothing bits out if I need to. Yeah. And also now if I divide this, it divides quite nicely. And I can, I've got this higher subdivision now that I can go on top of and I can start sculpting. If I remove the polyframe, you can see I can kind of go in and add detail into it where I want. Um, and I can go as high or as low as I want to, but then I've still got that low resolution that I can export for Maya and I can bake my maps out from the higher resolution. So that's a Z remesher. Z remesher is a super powerful tool and I would highly recommend using it in conjunction with Dynamesh if you're gonna use Dynamesh. So a couple of other functions that I want to talk about quickly. If you have Z remeshed your object and you want some quick UVs on it, if you're going to be exporting maps and you could either take this, you could take the lowest subdivision into Maya or whatever 3D package you're using and UV that and then bring it back in and replace that lowest subdivision with the UV version. That's my general workflow. But inside of ZBrush, we've also up here, we've got this Z plugin thing. We've got this one called UV master. And what UV master will do is it'll basically take the lowest subdivision of your model it will unwrap it and just give you some basic UVs. They're not going to be great, but they're also not necessarily awful. Um, you can choose if your object's symmetrical, then you can keep symmetry on. You can also give it a UV island per polygroup. We haven't gone into polygroups yet, um, but it's just something to be aware of. So I'm going to click unwrap on that. It's going to think about it. And now if I were to export this object, I have UVs on it. Just a handy little tip. You don't necessarily have to use it, but I thought it's, it's worth knowing at the beginner level. Um, if you're not too good with UVs or anything like that, then it's just good to know that it's there. So I just mentioned polygroups. So we've got this section here called polygroups. And basically what polygroups are is a way to kind of group sections of your mesh. If I click auto groups on this, you'll see it changes the color when I've got the polyframe option on. So we can, there's different ways to polygroup an object, but the easiest way is to do it by masking. So if I were to just mask off this whole section, and then I'm going to go to group mask here. So you can see all the different ones we've got. If I go group mask there, you can see now we've got two different colors on the mesh. This can be handy for multiple reasons. One thing I like to do is you can hide different poly groups. So I could kind of poly group up all the fins and then hide them if I needed to just work on those. So for example, um, I wanted to see this one, but this other one's getting in the way or whatever. So to hide different poly groups, you press control and shift on one and then just click on one and it will hide everything else. And you can press control and shift on the canvas to show everything again. So let's just, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna polygroup that mask. So you see now if I wanted to show that. And if I press control and shift on that, instead of on the canvas, I press it on that object then it will do the inverse selection. Then I, um, and then I can press to show everything again, I can press the background control and shift and that will do that. So I think that probably sums up all of the beginner knowledge that you sort of need to know for getting started in ZBrush sculpting. A lot of this is going to be experimentation. Um, and I do recommend that you just kind of open it, maybe start dynameshing or bring an object you already have and just start sculpting away, see what you can see, what you can do inside of it. Do leave any questions below. Now we're going to get into a time lapse of me sculpting this fish and the final result. Um, and I'm gonna kind of narrate what I was doing over it. If you have any questions, feel free to, to leave them below. Yeah, let's get started. So just a quick word from me whilst I'm editing this video, there's already been a lot of information in this video and I didn't want it to go on too long. So this time-lapse has been sped up quite dramatically. Um, 
just to kind of give you the idea of how I sculpted. If you wanted to see it, then I'll probably upload it a little bit slowed down without commentary on YouTube in full. So you can just hit subscribe and you'll see when that's up. But for now, it is quite a condensed version. Shows you everything, but very quickly. Enjoy. So first things first, I just took a basic shape from the ZBrush kind of built in shapes and I dynamesh that. And you can see I'm using the move tool to kind of push it and pull it around. Also using the flatten a little bit there and then starting to use the clay build up brush to add shape around the face. I've got reference off screen. Um, I just have some goldfish reference I found online and I'm using that to make sure that the silhouette and stuff and all the proportions are kind of in shape. So at this stage, I'm really just going in and blocking in kind of the main forms. I, I won't touch the fins for quite a, a bit. So I just want to make sure the body looks good. You can see I'm playing a lot with the thinness and the thickness and I didn't have a good photo from the top. So I didn't know how the shape of it looked um, from that angle. So I was just trying to find some more there. And really is just kind of building up as you go along. If I'm finding I'm not having enough geometry in places like inside that mouth when I started eating into the mesh, then I would just redyne mesh as I went. And you'll see in a second when I start to bring out the fins, um, I really don't mesh those as I go because they were super low geometry. So here I'm just getting a mask for where the fins are and I'm just using the move tool to bring those out. And then I'm redimensioning meshing that afterwards and then again, just moving them. found it actually gave me, especially on the top one, it gave me this nice kind of rippling by default, like the fins of fish actually do. So I got some nice detail for free, but if I didn't like that, then I could just use the smooth brush to kind of get rid of that. And then I'm just going back in on top of those with the clay build up to add actual shape and definition. They're a bit too thick to begin with, actual fish tails and stuff are super thin. Um, I don't do that right until the end after it's all kind of re-meshed just so that I don't have any weirdness when I do z remesher it. Sometimes it can be a bit funny with super thin objects. So I just wanted to make sure there was a bit of depth to play with originally. You can see I'm scaling down a bit there, but not too much. One thing to notice as well is that I'm using quite a shiny material on this. So I'm using the basic material too. I really like the way the spec kind of builds up on it um, and it can help you see if you've got any weird lumps in your mesh that the normal basic material wouldn't and the, the default matte cap. Just the way the light plays with it, you can help get nice curvature and stuff. So again, it's just kind of tweaking, making sure that the forms that are in the reference are there on this, adding in the details for the fins so that when I do Z remesh it, um, I can transfer some of that detail back. I haven't touched on transferring in this video, but um, that could probably be a separate video in itself. But it's useful to have detail in the DynaMesh so that when you remesh it, that you can just transfer that back to the lower resolution mesh. And this eye is quite a funny one as well. Looking at the reference, they're the really weird and bulbous, um, but it looked a bit weird when it was flat. So I did add a little bit of definition in there. And then later on, I go in and add a texture just so I'm seeing it a bit more just to help kind of frame it versus the reference that I know I'm looking at a bit better in terms of sizing and stuff. So I was just using masking there to close off the mouth. And now I'm going in and I've just see remeshed it. Just checking that out. I've got some weirdness on the tips of the fins like I was talking about earlier. So I'm just smoothing those off and then I'm gonna remesh it again. Just seeing how things are. Testing with a couple of other materials as well just to see what that looks like. And now I'm going in, I'm just painting a bit of the eye in. Not 100% necessary, but it just kind of helps ground it compared to the reference because then I can see if that's looking right or not, the size of the eye there. So now that I've got it remeshed, then I'm going back in and I'm adding the details onto the higher subdivisions that I've got. And it means I've got that lower resolution that I can take into Maya and UV or whatnot. And I've got the high resolution detail that I can transfer out into my maps and stuff. And this is just using the dam standard to get a little bit more definition on the edges of the tail. So it's nothing too fancy on this mesh in general. It's just a lot of building stuff up using the smooth brush, using the clay brush and the dam standards and then kind of smoothing it all out. For the scales, I you'll see in a bit, um, I tried a couple of different ways. Those were probably the most complicated bit of this. Usually I'd probably use Mari for things like scales just because I have a lot more control over it with the layers. There are layers in ZBrush, but they're a bit fiddly. And also Mari has nice things like the triplanar for kind of projecting patterns all over. But it is nice and ZBrush that you can kind of 
plop that down, plop those alphas down, and then you can sculpt on top of them, which again, you'll see soon, but that's what I ended up doing just to help break it up a bit. So now I'm just going into the edges of the tail and just breaking it up a little bit further, like the reference. It's not very smooth, so I'm just using the move brush to add little bits to that. And I'm just checking the thickness of these fins as well, just to make sure they are still quite thin and they're not too chunky. And then I'm just adding the kind of wobbling and these kind of streaks that you get that I'm seeing in the reference. So on the final stretch now, just going in and breaking up the edge of those fins once again, just to get really kind of minute detail like I'm seeing in the reference. And now I'm just masking off the body where I'm going to put the scales. You're going to see me try a couple of methods here. First of all, I'm going to use the noise maker under the surface option. We haven't touched on this, but it's a good way to kind of apply alphas. When I first used it, um, it was adding a weird noise onto the alpha and I couldn't get rid of that. So I decided against it. Um, and then I've gone in, I've added this alpha that I'm using on the brush, but I found that the the drop off on the edges was giving me funny results. So I went back to the noise maker, managed to get rid of that noise and it worked quite nicely. I'm just changing the scale of this alpha now because I wanted it to stretch in the Y axis a bit more. So I plot that down, but it's giving me some weirdness on the top and bottom of the mesh. So I've gone in and I've hand added those with alphas into a brush like I was showing earlier. And then because that's given me some odd bits where it's joined up, then I'm just going in hand sculpting on top of that and just smoothing everything out. And then just around the rest of the body, I'm also breaking up some of these tiles so they don't look like just the tiled alpha all over the body, just to help blend it in a little bit more and give it a bit more variety. And overall, for quite a quick sculpt, looks all right, does the job. So I was quite happy with that. And then I'm just going to duplicate it now, just going to pose it now using some of the deformation tabs, some of the bends and stuff, and then I'm just duplicating it and adding a second one doing some different deformers on that so it looks a little bit posed. And overall, really, that's it. All of the tools that I've taught you in this video helped me produce this. There's not that many other things that I used. It's just practice, really. So yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave them below. As always, I try and respond to everything. I might well upload this time lapse, this sculpt, without my commentary and maybe a little bit slowed down because it has been quite quick. So if you fancy seeing that, then you can hit subscribe or for any other tutorials that I've made, then check out my channel. Uh, take it easy. Stay safe out there. It's a weird thing to say on these videos, but I feel the need saying and best of luck, whatever you're doing in 3D.